taking off from that, where um, we need such spaces, and on the other hand, there are certain certain other such spaces like the history textbooks that mm -hmm. are being rewritten, and the representation of particular uh, events in history, finding different kinds of representation um, in media uh, through, say, the Doordarshan um, channels, which have produced some um, big epic stories, which may not necessarily um, stand by that history. History has become a battleground in some senses. It is this battleground that a university plays a role, uh, a central role in. So uh, what I'm asking here is this relationship between the university and the need for this um, intellectual um, battleground that we seem to, would seem to be losing in, a, in the current political condition. Yes, well, um, the battleground is very necessary. You're absolutely right. I mean, I'm not saying that people should actually go out with guns and shoot each other, certainly not. Uh, but um, discussion, debate, different views, different points of view, different opinions, these have to be aired. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, now, history is a battleground. History has been a battleground in other societies as well. Um, I'm, I remember the first time when I heard uh, people from the NDA get up and talk about how the books that we had written and I had written too for middle schools, textbooks, uh, that these were anti-national, anti-Indian, uh, written by perverts. I don't think they understood the meaning of the term, but still they used it, and that they should be prohibited. And I began to wonder why this desperate attack on textbooks. And then you realize that ideologies like the ones that are motivating the politics of the NDA governments, are ideologies which are very heavily dependent on a particular interpretation of the past. And so obviously textbooks will be a target of attack and they've become a target of attack again. Recently there's been this problem in, in Gujarat and, and in various other places and so on. And they will continue to be a target of attack. That one can prophesy as it were if it's anything. Now, remember the two things. One is that you have ideologies that are dependent on the past because they're ideologies which are raising an image of this is how our society was in the past. And it was great, it was harmonious, it was prosperous, there were no problems, there were no rationalists asking awkward questions, there were no nastics on the scene and that kind of thing. That ideal picture has to be presented and has to be presented within the confines of the kind of religious ideology that you're propagating. So you have golden ages in which all of this happened and it's the Vedic age and the Gupta age and so on. Um, surprising they don't, don't talk about the Chola age as a golden age where all of this was really much more rampant than it was in the Gupta age, but nevertheless, uh, maybe that's a geographical divide. Um, so there, there is that aspect to it. But also remember, as Eric Hobsbawm said famously, that history is to nationalism what the poppy is to the opium eater. Mm -hmm. That nationalism cannot do without the, um, you know, the, the imagination and the force that, that history provides, can provide if need be, and is therefore like a bit of opium. Um, keeping this in mind, one has to, as a historian, always be very cautious about the opium eaters and the opium that is being produced. And this is part of what the struggle is over the textbooks. Um, this is going to be a continuing struggle, as I said, and we begin with the thing about the rewriting of history. Now, as I said earlier, as knowledge advances, 
history has to be rewritten. We know that whether there is nationalism or not, whether there is a Hindutva ideology or not, whether there is Marxism or not, as knowledge advances, there will be a rewriting of that particular discipline, in this case, history. So in this, we, uh, when we started writing our history, were critical of, we were heavily critical of the colonial interpretation, and many of us attacked it frontally. And we were critical of some aspects of the nationalist interpretation that followed the colonial interpretation and didn't bring in any new ideas. So we were, in a sense, rewriting history. I mean, the business about saying that we were writing a Marxist history is really absolute nonsense, because they're really, the people don't understand what a Marxist history is when they make remarks like that, because it wasn't a Marxist history as such. Anyway, uh, but we were rewriting history. Now, again, you've got a, an ideological body that has come in, the Hindutva people with their own ideology and their ideas of history. They wish to rewrite history. So someone may say, so what's the difference? A, the history that is now being brought in is not based on a deep study of history, of knowledge as it is, and the advances that have been made in knowledge. It's not that. It is an ideological position that is imposed on the past. And that is a very different story from the kind of rewriting that we people were doing. Um, in order to make history into something which is intellectually viable, and that is really what historians are about. They're not just telling a story. They're not just telling a narrative. They are searching for an explanation of the past. Uh, we don't even claim, as was claimed 50 years ago, that the historian is searching for the truth. We're not searching for the truth. We're searching for an explanation of the past, which will enable us to understand the present a little better. All right. What does this search involve? It involves, first of all, that you go to all the range of sources that you can find on that particular subject. You don't limit yourself to one source, you go to the whole lot. What does this mean, for example, to take the example of Vedic studies, what does this mean? It means, first of all, that you go through all the texts that are included in the Vedic corpus which means that you should know the language, the text, pretty well, and you should know the linguistical study that is being carried out. Because today, it's not enough just to know the language of the text. You have to know what linguistics is telling you about the broader dimensions of the words and the grammar and the use of the language. All right. You have to know about archaeology in terms of not forcing a fit, fit uh, what a friend of mine used to always call the tyranny of the text on the archaeologist. You don't want that. You want to see whether there is a correlation, whether the archaeological evidence is chronologically related and whether it's giving you a dimension which the textual evidence may not be giving you. So there's that. All right. Today, in the discussion of the Vedic period, you also have to consult hydrology because those rivers kept changing. Uh, the the Sutlej particularly is probably, you know, the one river which has created the greatest misery because it's constantly going up and down, it's capturing other waters and so on. And then you have the Hakra which disappears into the desert. What is the hydrology of this region? And how does that map of the hydrology fit into the map of what we are told in the Rig Veda and other Vedic texts about the geography of where people are settled and, you know, where they have their big settlements and so on. So there's that, that aspect. Now what is coming in is yet another aspect, which I'm at the moment rather cautious about, DNA genetics, because the DNA studies where they're saying, oh, we'll tell you who the Aryans were. Now, the search for the Aryans is in some ways a strange kind of exercise, because we, the term itself is not a biological term. It is, in fact, a linguistic term. And we should more correctly be saying the Aryan-speaking people. And we should be looking at 
those that spoke Indo-Aryan and those according to the text who spoke other languages. We have references to the Dasa Bhasha, we have references to the Mlecha Bhasha. These are not Indo-Aryan languages. These are languages being spoken by other people. So there were other people over there. And for the historian, the fundamental question is not who were the Aryans and how far back do they go? The fundamental question is what was the relationship between the Indo-Aryan speaking people and all these other people? How did they relate to the others culturally, linguistically, politically as the case may be? So there's that aspect to it. Now all of this presupposes when you start looking at the range of sources you have to be an expert in all kinds of disciplines so you start building teams of research. No single person really has the answer. You have to do it through, through teamwork. Then there is the process, the methodology, the kind of thing that we always teach our students and it is a difficult course as you will uh, I'm sure agree. Historical method. How does one do history? I remember giving this talk at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore to a bunch of students and one of the questions they asked me was, you're talking about historical method but there isn't such a thing. Only science has a method because in science you can demonstrate what you're saying and there is an element of prediction that if you go wrong your experiment fails but if you're right then you predict. And I said, no, it's different with us, but we do have a method. And our method is that A, you have to be sure you've consulted all the sources. B, you've checked the reliability of the sources. You cannot say that because there is a reference to the Pushpa Vimana in the Ramayana, that there were aeroplanes you have to then ask yourself difficult questions like was there a theory of aerodynamics? What was the structure of the plane? How was it built? What was the way in which the machine moved? Etc, etc, etc. Which takes you into a different kind of specialization. So you check the reliability of the sources and this is absolutely fundamental. You then suggest a hypothesis and say perhaps if that, that and that was there then this, this and this happened because of this and you suggest causality on the basis of logic, a logical analysis. And then finally you test your generalization by saying therefore I think this is what happened. Does it fit in with the sources and does it fit in with the examination I've carried out. Now this is a tough process. I mean, you know, even the one semester course that we do at JNU is really not sufficient. It's something that has to go on and once you take up research, you're doing this all the time. It's a constant and even, I mean, at this age when I settle down to writing a lecture or a paper, I'm going through this process. It's now become automatic, but one is going through this process. Now this process is not what the ideology of the present system is going through. They are picking up narratives from, from wherever they like and putting them together uh, without testing the, without really first of all checking whether they've consulted all the sources, without testing the reliability of the sources and without giving us a logical, rational explanation. And this is my problem. I mean, yes, if you want to rewrite history, go ahead and rewrite history. I mean, after all, the subaltern school also rewrote history, but they used techniques that historians regard as legitimate. They were not mythologizing, they were not fantasizing. But this kind of rewriting of history is something which is largely fantasy. And it's fantasy with a very strong political ideology backing it and therefore one is wary of it.